Okay. Um, I want to thank first uh, Professor Ahmed and uh, all the EGA for this invitation. Um, it's a great honor for me to present here today on behalf of, uh, of ESCA, a society partner of EGA. Um, um, and uh, let me um, introduce myself just for a while. This is my conflict of interest disclosure. So I worked in, uh, in um, um, Brescia in Italy, in the north, uh, close to Milan. And, uh, and I was a founder together with Enrico Gervasi of Asia Gascot. And uh, um, I was on the, in the board of ESCA and I was a chairman of uh, the um, uh, shoulder section. And actually, I'm the godfather of the Escas Larda um, Traveling Fellowship. So I'm going to visit some of our friends from South America that probably are here today. Um, ESCA is a big society, as you know, that covers uh, um, so many countries and members and delegates, uh, not only from Europe, but as you can see here, 35% of members are international outside of, of Europe countries. And uh, it consists of many committees and uh, specifically sections dedicated to ankle and foot, hip arthritis, hip preservation, knee surgery, uh, uh, shoulder, uh, as I said, and the sports medicine. Uh, activities of VESCA are very important in terms of education. Uh, webinars reported free online uh, activities reported that so many participants exceeding 20,000 of uh, people. And uh, uh, all the uh, instructional courses are very, uh, uh, very effective in terms of education for all the participants. Uh, but we have also one-to-one uh, -one, um, surgical skill courses that are very uh, crucial uh, for improvement of the surgical skill of everyone. Uh, fellowships are open to all ESCA members, European and international, and these are very great opportunities for network, for improving knowledge, and uh, uh, to uh, have a great experience all over the world, because the exchange program between different continents is very, very effective and promising. Uh, actually, we have a collaborations with Asia Pacific and with the South America and North America. And finally, this is the Congress of 2024 that we're going to organize in Italy, in Milan specifically. And so we uh, wait for all of you uh, to join the meeting and uh, to bring your contribute as presentations and, and whatever you want. Okay, so let's start with our presentation. Um, uh, my talk is on the multidirectional instability, and as you can see here, uh, the classifications of multidirectional instability have been proposed in different ways, uh, like AMBRI um, since the beginning by, by Matson, or according to the STEMO triangle, the type 2 and type 3 polar types, or also uh, like a sort of uh, combination of congenital neuromuscular and acquired repetitive microtrauma components uh, according to some other Others. Uh, this is the most, probably the most recent uh, classification of uh, um, uh, multidirectional instability, as you can see here. Different components, non traumatic and uh, micro traumatic. And then we have a volunteer and unvolunt uh, voluntary and involuntary uh, type of, uh, of uh, uh, multidirectional instability. Uh, so, uh, different components, as you can see here, anatomical and functional, uh, that contributes to uh, the multidirectional instability. And in different ways, the spectrum of disease is very complex because in every patient we have both functional and anatomical problems. From an anatomical standpoint, key factors, as you can see, are capsular uh, problems, labral insufficiency and glenoid morphology, specifically the glenoid uh, surface um, is altered. Uh, in some cases, we have to recognize if problems are related to an acquired condition or congenital. Congenital hyperlaxity for sure is one of the most common uh, uh, component of uh, multidirectional instability. Uh, connective tissue disorders in more severe cases, but also non-pathological condition like a sort of hypermobility that is uh, present in almost uh, 5 to 15% of general population. Uh, acquired 
uh, hyperlaxity is, is a different condition that uh, is related to the spectrum of disease of uh, specific sports activities. And this is the condition well described by Ben Keebler in which normal anatomy day by day changes in a so-called adaptive pathology, which is not symptomatic, uh, but uh, is a condition uh, that uh, allows the athlete to perform at the best. Uh, but when this, this becomes uh, symptomatic, this becomes really a disease, this becomes a, a pathology. But when we treat this condition, uh, take care to bring the athlete to the adaptive pathology conditions and not to the normal anatomy as we used to consider uh, what is normal. Because for these athletes, the condition of normal anatomy guarantees the best performance. If you bring him to the normal anatomy condition, uh, is not able to throw anyway or to perform is a specific athletic task. So they have to leave them just sitting on the cliff. Uh, and regarding controllable containment, uh, we have a different, spec different conditions, different patterns of disease on the posterior labral, posterior and anterior labrum, but mostly located on the posterior side, like a, pos like a loss of posterior labral height or some clefts into the labrum, uh, which are related to a condition of uh, symptomatic instability. And regarding glenoid abnormalities, this is a controversial issue, really, uh, because the different anatomic studies and imaging studies are being reported showing a different condition, like an increased glenoid retroversion in patients with the MDI, or a loss of glenoid concavity, as described by Philippe Moroder, or also, as recently reported in a recent study by Yo, uh, a convex glenoid. So uh, the morphology of bony glenoid is really uh, relevant uh, uh, to establish the cause, the cause of, uh, of a multidirectional instability. Let's uh, take, um, let's uh, focus on the functional factors. Abnormal scapular kinematics always uh, encountered in patients with, uh, with an MDI, uh, and these are typically uh, consist of uh, a reduced scapular upward rotation through the, the complete range of motion and increased the scapular internal rotation during arm elevation. Alter the muscle firing um, in terms of uh, prolonged activation of muscles that stabilize the human head and the shorter activation of muscles that accelerate the motion of the shoulder and the, and the shoulder girdle. And impaired proprioception is another point that can be rehabilitated uh, during uh, treatment. Uh, this uh, recent uh, um, um, classification of a functional shoulder instability as proposed by Moroder uh, uh, mm, showed uh, that uh, a difference between the positional and the non-positional uh, functional uh, instability. For positional, we have a controllable and non-controllable, so voluntary and involuntary component, and the same for non-positional. The role of positional or non-positional is strictly related to muscle activation, and this can be uh, changed with uh, an effective rehabilitation. And the voluntary component of the multidirectional instability must be um, um, uh, investigated and, and addressed if necessary because most of the times there is a muscle problem, a muscle activation pattern problem. So what's the best treatment for these patients? Conservative must be the first line option in all of our cases with an MDI. When pain is the main complaint, and with the, there is a history of uh, subluxations with no bony defects, and in this case, the success is guaranteed in very high percentage of cases. Well, when we should operate these patients, when we failed with the conservative treatment, in case of a history of recurrent dislocations, and in case of bony defects, because also in an MDI, we can find a bony defects, even if uh, most of the time it's smaller than in traumatic instability cases. Conservative treatment is based uh, on function. So primary focus, pay attention on function, on muscle activation pattern, train the scapular thoracic joint, uh, regain the, the core stability, strengthen the rotator cuff, and improve the proprioceptive feedback uh, to improve the efficiency of scapular stabilizers. 
Uh, the shoulder pacemakers proposed by Moroder again uh, uh, used for uh, um, instabil posterior instability treatment uh, is very effective also in cases of uh, uh, patients with a positional uh, functional instability, multidirectional instability of the shoulder. What about capsular shift, which is the classical treatment for a surgical uh, um, um, approach? Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, systematic literature published some years ago, there is no real difference between open and, and, and arthroscopic capsule shift. Uh, but if you look at the postoperative stiffness, there is a higher consistent risk of uh, postoperative stiffness with the open capsule shift. So probably arthroscopic shift is preferable. And uh, when we perform this procedure, pay attention to avoid any uh, the Kapan capsule application is described since the beginning by Steve Snyder and other authors. So do not fix the capsule to the labrum alone because it fails. So use suture anchors all around the glenoid and uh, regarding rotator interval closure, it was uh, very popular at the beginning of this procedure, but actually it's really debated because there is a consistent risk of loss of uh, external rotation with the arm at side as not effective in controlling instability. Uh, Enrico Gervasi uh, published this uh, technique some years ago uh, to improve uh, and the, the stability in, in cases of multidirectional instability, it consists of uh, an augmentation of the glenoid labrum uh, in anterior, inferior, and the posterior uh, to deepen the glenoid and uh, increase the, the uh, humerus to glenoid contact area. Uh, this is a technique that personally uh, perform in cases of uh, multidirectional instability and in case of uh, anterior instability with a severe labral attenuation and is very effective in controlling uh, the risk of recurrence. And at the MRI we showed that six months postoperatively a good integration of the scaffold, uh, which is a collagen membrane, rolled up. And uh, to create a new labrum, so a good integration to the surrounding tissues and uh, to the bone as well. Tendon graft is another option reported uh, as a case uh, report uh, in case of uh, connective tissue disorders. Achilles tendon or semitendinosus graft have been used. Bone block has been used uh, in case of failed stabilization, and this is a very tough problem because we don't know exactly what to do when a procedure for multidirectional stability failed. Probable bone block can be an option, anterior and posterior, but pay attention to the presence of bone loss. If there is no bone loss, there is no indication to bone block procedures because the bony deficiency is not the problem for these patients. Uh, semitendinosus and gracilis autograph with the bone block harvested from the uh, attachment site of the tendons to the tibia is an option because at the same time you can address a bony defect and, and a capsule defect. This is a case example of a um, young lady with Ehlers Danlos disease, type 3 Ehlers Danlos disease. Uh, no bone loss of the CT scan, but with a very severe capsule redundancy, uh, and the patient failed at the conservative treatment. So, what we do in this case is a capsule augmentation with a tendon graft, allograft, and the a piece of graft is used uh, to reconstruct the, 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 the labrum according to the de technique proposed by Enrico. Uh, so we uh, address at the same time the capsule and the labrum. So in conclusion, the MDI uh, diagnosis and treatment as well, very challenging, conservative treatment must be the first option. Uh, surgery uh, should focus first on soft tissues because most of the times this is the main problem of these patients. If there is a bone issue, okay, for a bone block procedure, but bone block could not solve soft tissue problems. Thank you.